what I'm going to talk about is what do we do about it? And he mentioned briefly about some of the things going on, but I'm going to go deeper into that um, to see what options do we have, how do we innovate, and um, can we do something about it substantial that will change the trends of the past? So, to really understand what those trends are, <coughs> I'm going to take you back in history of where it all started, how we got into this problem of climate change. And it all goes back to this period of how we used to live. And uh, you, know, you go back to the Revolutionary War, the birth of the United States, <coughs> Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, writing all these very famous documents about our nation. And at that time, this is how people used to live. Of course, you didn't have color photography at that time, but you have paintings. Uh, people used to travel in, you know, in horse carriages, in this case with two horses. They used to light their homes with whale oil, and that's how life was. And I think our founding fathers probably would have never imagined how we live today. And today, instead of you know, two horse carriages, we do this. We have 300 horses taking us to the grocery store. And you know we have uh, 100,000 horses taking us across the country in about five or six hours, which would have otherwise taken months. That's the transformation we have seen over the last 240 years, the life of the United States. But it happened not just in the United States, everywhere in the world. So we know uh, Steve Chu and I wrote an article uh, a few years ago where we call this this industrial revolution horsepower to horsepower. <laughs> and this is a transformation which is, you know, 240, 250 years, is a very small blip in the history of humans. So the last 250 years has been a, just the most remarkable period of our existence in terms of the human ingenuity, innovation that has transformed the lives and really improve the prosperity and quality of life. But it has the consequence. So this is what we do today, and instead of whale oil, we do this. This is the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century, the electricity grid. This was the internet in the 1920s, 1900, early 1900s, where people suddenly could light their homes, and they could make dishwashers and, and telephones and all that, all out of electricity. So, if you look at what has happened over the last 240, 250 years, this is what has happened. The global per capita GDP has gone up exponentially. This is, this is the United States being born. And look at this. Per capita GDP, not just the total GDP. Per capita GDP, which is a measure of our prosperity. Of course, it's not been uniform. But on average, it's gone really well. Um, the global population has gone up from 700 million people that we had in the world in 1750s, 1760s to about 7 billion today, and the projection is going to be about 10 billion with the error bar of 10 billion. And it really depends on the fertility of women in Africa. That's really where you know, most of the population growth is going to be. And because of the, and, and this has been enabled, not because, this has been enabled by the energy use. And this is the energy use in biomass, it used to biomass, coal, oil, gas, a little bit of nuclear <coughs> and um, renewables. And you can see that without this energy, this would have never happened. I mean, the whole mobility, the whole internet use you guys are all used to, the internet would come to a standstill if there was no electricity. And of course, you heard the consequences of that, and if this is going up, if this is going up linearly, this goes up, um, exponentially, because CO2, the lifetime of CO2 molecules in the atmosphere, is a few hundred years. So it just, it's like a big capacitor. You put it out there, it stays there. And I'll show you a little diagram of what the carbon flow is like. So, good thing, bad thing. Very simple. So these are, I call global exponentials. And the, but the world is not flat. This is not uniform. These are the average. I'll tell you what the non-uniformity is, which is one of the imperatives that we have out here as well. This is the global carbon balance. 
If you look at the fossil fuel emissions, we emit about 10 gigatons of carbon per year, about 30, 36 gigatons of CO2. But in terms of carbon, carbon budget, we emit from the fossil fuel about 10 gigatons. If you look at photosynthesis around the world, we have a, a 120 gigatons of carbon coming in and about 120 going out with a net of three coming in. Okay, so the actual fluxes of carbon are an order of magnitude higher than what we emit from our fossil fuel. And if you look at the oceans, we absorb about 90 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere, um, and about 90 plus 2, and 90 goes out, 2 remains, which is the remaining, which is what is the cause of acidification, etc. And so, and this, if you look at this number compared to 120, so 120 plus 3 and 120 going up, it's a small fraction. But it is the balance in all these activity carbon flow that we're disrupting right now. And the question that we have to answer is, okay, so can we reduce our emissions from here? But as you heard from Chris Fields, that is fine, that is necessary, but not sufficient. We have to introduce some negative emissions as well. Otherwise, we're not going to reach zero emissions total or stabilize the atmospheric carbon dioxide. Now, if you try to increase the CO2 absorption in the ocean, as we know, these, when carbon dioxide goes in and mixes with water from bicarbonate, carbonic acid, you get a proton out, which is an acid, and then that is what is messing up our ecosystem in the oceans. So that's one source and could be fixed that carbon in some way in calcium carbonates or some other things. That's one possibility. The other possibility is could be enhanced photosynthesis without having the adverse effect on water, on land use, etc. We don't know quite how to do that. But that's where the science, engineering, innovations have to go. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And of course we have to reduce it. So one of the prospects of this, and Chris talked about some good news, and I'm going to go deeper as to how good that news really is, and what are the challenges that we face. So here we go. We're going to talk about this, but I'll talk about this very briefly as well. This is a map. These are two maps overlay on each other. The red is the population density. This is where the people live. Okay? And the lights is where the electricity is or it's a proxy for energy. And you can see the United States very bright, right? You can see that we are somewhere around here. Um, and you can see that, you know, this is bright, and of course we need to keep it bright. We've got to turn off the lights. But there are many parts of the world that have not turned on the lights yet. And we really want to enable them to turn on the lights and turn on the blank hand lights. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So if you look around the world and ask, what are the big, big challenges that we have that you all will have to figure out how to solve? Here are three of them. Number one is, how do we decarbonize our energy system? There's no question we have to do that. But also continue with economic growth. So good thing, economic growth, exponential growth, which is great. But carbon is bad, so how do we get the benefit of economic growth and prosperity, but not have a decarbonized system simultaneously. Chris mentioned a little bit of that. Secondly, climate change is not just happening, it is accelerating. If you look at the sea change, the sea level rise curve, if you remember that when you presented, it's not a linear thing. It is exponentially increasing. And so how do we adapt to climate change? Because climate change is already happening. And finally, how, we, how, we, how can we enable access to affordable energy to the one and a half to three billion people who either have no access or very marginal access to it? Okay, that's the labor. So these are the three big challenges that you, we, we all will have to address. And we are trying to do that here at Stanford. When you make choices of energy, you have to think about security access to energy. I've mentioned about Mexico, Canada, United States. We are energy independent collectively. 
Uh, of course, a lot of that is carbon-based, but there is some of it zero carbon-based. The cost really matters. It's a commodity. If something is really expensive, it doesn't matter because it will never get it. It has to compete. Um, there's a capital cost. I won't go into that. Clean and environment, sustainable, and infrastructure. One has to always think about it. Is it a centralized infrastructure? Is it decentralized? Because how that develops is very different. And to address all of this, it is not just a technology issue. It is an issue about technology, about markets, about policy, about finance, about business models. And the innovations have to happen across all of them. And they have to be aligned. They have to reinforce each other, as opposed to fight against each other, which sometimes happens. If the policy is looking backwards, and the technology is moved ahead, then you suddenly find, oh my god, it's really bad for the technology to get in. I won't go into that details, but I'll, I'll just keep it up at that level, and we can have a Q&A on that. So I'm going to focus on the technology part, is what could be, you know, this is a time not to be incremental. Given the challenge that we have, given those two things, we've got to be bold and audacious about our goals. Because this is a fundamental tectonic shift in our energy system and the way we live. It's big. So we need to look at game-changing technologies uh, to really change the market. Okay. This is not for incremental improvement of, you know, let's improve, let's make the wheel a little bit better. No. You've got to go from a horse carriage to a car now. <laughs> That's the fundamental shift we're talking about. It is not one technology. It is not 100. It's on the order of 10. So I think you all should have your top 10 ideas of technologies that can really change the ballgame. And I'm going to present mine, top 10, and in the form of a great American philosopher that I'll talk about, from David Letterman. I don't know who remembers David Letterman. You guys may be too young. Okay. David Letterman, every night, used to come and say, these are the top 10 things. So this is my top 10 David Letterman uh, top, you know, game-changing energy innovation in no particular order. So don't take this as that's the most important. That's, no, this is all important. So here we go. Number 10, carbon capture from coal-fired coal -fired power plants at a cost of less than $30 a ton. And from directly from air, if possible, at less than $150 a ton. Today, from coal-fired power plants, it's about $60 to $70 a ton. You've got to cut that in half at least. Otherwise, it is non viable economically, unless there's a price in carbon. We don't have a price in carbon. If we do get a price in carbon, it will be about $40, $50. So you've got to have the cost lower than the price. Make it business viable. Okay? So that's one. Number nine, photovoltaic systems that are lighter and more efficient, enabling fully installed capital cost of a 50 cents per watt with a levelized cost of two and a half cents per watt. So when we were in the Department of Energy, Mark Hartley and I, we were there in the Department of Energy. We started something called Sunshot. You know, Kennedy had Moonshot, Obama had Sunshot. No, <laughs> it's not to go to the sun and return safely in a decade. <laughs> it is to reduce the cost, unsubsidized cost of electricity from solar by the end of the decade to five cents a kilowatt hour, or fifty dollars a megawatt hour, to be cost competitive. This is going beyond. This is going to two two and a half cents, and I'll tell you why. Number nine. Number eight, battery storage at a capital cost of less than $100 a kilowatt hour and with more than how we cycle. Today, you will see, I'll show you some data, it's about $300 a kilowatt hour. But if you could do that, it changes the ball game, not only for transportation, but for the grid. Number seven, modular nuclear plants. Nuclear is the biggest source of carbon-free energy, but it's, very, it's expensive. So reducing the cost of $3 a watt, the levelized cost of $0.07 cents a kilowatt hour. Number six, deep borehole carbon-free geothermal energy with levelized cost of seven to eight cents a kilowatt hour. We don't know how to do that. It's too expensive to drill. New drilling technology for geothermal would be terrific. Um, ultra high voltage transmission line and low cost of integration of intermittent renewables. If you have more than 50% renewables in a grid, which you'd like to, the grid was never designed for it. And I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, building performance standards combined with energy efficient buildings. And you'll be living in some of your graduate student housing out here. We want to start to make Stanford 
buildings in Stanford Living as a role model for the rest of the world. And I really hope you take that up as part of your effort out here. Number three, internal combustion engine is not going to go away right away. This is not just your reciprocating engine, but your rotary engine as well in your jet engine receptor. These are all internal combustion engines. More than 50% efficiency with fuel mixtures. Um, storing carbon-free energy in fuels, okay, as opposed to batteries, at $2 a gallon of gasoline equivalent. If you could do that, this is disruptive. Okay? $2 a gallon making oil from carbon-free energy. And finally, rewiring photosynthesis to induce negative emissions and, in, and something in peace food product to without affecting water use, without affecting land use, etc. Okay, so these are, these are my top 10. You guys should figure out your top 10. If you could do a few of them really well, um, I think this is game changing. And this is some of the things that we will be talking about out here while you're here. And all of this, some, some of this is all going on. And so, as you can see, I'm not putting in the form of, here's a mechanical engineering problem, here's a biology problem. No. These are the challenges. You figure out who you want to team with. Remember you asked me? Who you want to team with in material science and engineering and someone in, med in a medical school to figure out how you want to address it together. This will lead all the minds. I'm, going to I'm not going to talk about 10 of these in detail. Um, I'll talk about two. Two things that you know, are kind of dear to me. The first is the grid. Why is this important? This is, Chris mentioned a little bit of this in his talk. And this is the exciting part. This is the contract price. This is a business contract, not the cost, but business contracts that have been signed, long-term contracts, in selling wind. Here's the wind, electricity, the cost, or the price, not the cost, at about $25 to $30 a megawatt hour. Okay, so three and a half to four cents um, a megawatt hour. And this is solar out here. And this blurriness is the error bar in the data. Yeah, I just made it a nice pretty. <laughs> but that's what it is. And you can see that this has come down to the point that, and this has, a, in the United States, has a little bit of subsidy of $23 a megawatt hour in wind. And so if you remove that, it will go to about $43 or so $45 a megawatt hour. It's pretty good. And this is solar, as you can see. And the capacity, because it's cheap, the cost is coming down, or the price is coming, the cost is coming down, the price is coming down, the capacity is going up exponentially. What is this, you know, how do these numbers really matter? It matters when you compare. So this is where, so by the way, these are, this is the record, unsubsidized price for wind in Morocco, three cents a kilowatt hour, thirty dollars a megawatt hour, unsubsidized. And this is for solar in Mexico, thirty-six dollars a megawatt hour, two point six cents a kilowatt. Amazing. What is it in relation to? <coughs> this is where U.S. natural gas and China coal is okay, today. So what you're finding is that renewable energy is not only cheap; it's going to get cheaper. And, and you know, solar and both solar and wind, and there's plenty of headroom in solar. This is where U.S. coal and nuclear. The sad part out here is that nuclear is expensive, and but that is the largest carbon-free source of energy, and that's what this is. So we obviously have to figure out how to reduce this cost, but the other things are getting cheaper. So now people say, okay, California has a mandate. We're going to be 50% renewable by 2030. 50% renewable. Today it's about 25%. So, how do we get there? And I'll talk a little bit about it. This is the good news. In terms of capital investment, financial capital investment, we find that the green is the investments in clean energy, in decarbonized energy. Red is in oil and gas. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, we have to invest in that because we still need our fuel for our transportation, etc. But for the first time, you find that the investment, global, it's 300, you know, 300 something billion dollars, is higher in renewable energy as opposed to oil and gas. First time in history. This is only one year. We'll see what happens this year and the next year. If it keeps going like that, that's a trend. But this has happened for the first time. Now, 
this is another chart which I think is very important. Here's the history of how economies have changed energy mix. We used to be all wood, then it turned to coal, oil, gas, then a little bit of nuclear, and there's some renewables out here. Renewables are still a very small fraction. But it, it used to take 40 or 50 years for the change to happen. We don't have the luxury of that now. Because if it's 40 or 50 years in trying to decarbonize the system, game may be over. At least the life as we know it. So instead of, so do developing economies have to go through wood, which is where they are today, through coal, through oil and gas? Or is there an opportunity for them to leapfrog from here to there? And that's an opportunity that should not be ignored. And that's one of the things because, frankly, it is cheaper to develop it in a different way than trying to go through this whole gamut of the spectrum of energy mixes. I'm going to talk about the grid. The grid was, is very important as a system because if you're trying to introduce 50, 60 percent renewables, it is non-trivial to do that. Why? Because our current grid paradigm is what I call the Tesla Edison paradigm. Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison. They competed against each other. Late 1800s, early 1900s to develop a grid paradigm. And this paradigm and the architecture of the grid has not changed. The devices may have changed, but the architecture has not changed. And what is the paradigm? Well, you have centralized power station, very large thermal power station or hydroelectric power stations. Why large? Because it was cheaper per unit kilowatt hour. That's why they made it large. Then you have long distance high voltage transmission. The first one was from Niagara Falls to New York City. High voltage, long distance transmission. High voltage because your current is lower, your losses are lower. The higher you go, the longer you can go. Then you have, then you reduce your voltage to your distribution networks in your neighborhoods, which is typically at 13 kilovolts. Don't touch those wires. 13 kilovolts is a jolt. And then you, from your neighborhood wires, you step down and you get actually 240, and you get from the neutral, you get 120. That's how you operate. Okay. And the whole grid runs today at 60 hertz. And the paradigm is that the power is generated from here. It goes to thousands of billions of loads at the edge of the grid. These are passive loads. And the power only flowed in one direction. And when you turn on your switch up here to turn on the lights, somewhere the generator had to ramp up. Remember, this is Nikola Tesla's and Thomas Edison's time. There was no internet. It was barely telephone. How did the generator know that the light has gone on? Light has been turned on, and some motor has been turned on, load has been turned on. How did they know? Anyone knows? Frequency. Because when you turn on your load, your machines will run a little slower because it's just a drag on them. So your 60 hertz becomes 59 hertz, 59.9 hertz, 59 hertz, etc. And then suddenly the generator operator will synchronize, oh my machine is slowing down, and so they ramp it up a little bit to bring it back to 60 hertz. That's a feedback control. That's how the grid started running. That's how it runs today. It's a very simple control mechanism. That was the only way, I mean, that was the only way to communicate, frankly, and in those days. Today, we have a few other ways of communicating. And that's one of the things that we will, that we're going to talk about briefly. Finally, this is not, this is continuous generation, centralized continuous generation. So if you ramp up, you turn on your load, they could ramp up and they can, the generation always track the load. But as we know now, in wind and solar, the generation doesn't track the load, the generation tracks the wind or tracks the sun. So somehow, our whole paradigm is changed now. Should the load be tracking the generation? Maybe. How would the load know when to turn off or when to dim? Well, maybe there are other ways of communicating. This is the whole paradigm of what I call bits and what, and I'll talk very briefly about it. So when you try to integrate renewables, imagine if you did this today, the question of stability, of cost, of reliability, efficiency, emission goals, security, 
market structures and pricing mechanisms, business models, regulation, regulatory frameworks, people acceptance. All of this has to be taken into account. All of this will change because the whole paradigm has shifted. And the Tesla Edison grid was never designed for these changes. So the fundamental infrastructure that our internet and everything else that we do in our life depends on the fact that you can hear me with a mic that depends on electricity, the fact that I can project everything we do depends on electricity. That fundamental infrastructure will have to change. That's the times that we're living in right now. And a lot of people in the utility world and the electricity world are really worried. But what will happen to their businesses? Because once this thing changes, the paradigm changes, the business model, the regulatory structure will also have to change. So, what enabling technologies that we can leverage today? Well, we have power systems that we can manage electronically. Silicon transistors are not just used for your information processing. They are also used for controlling power. And they use that for your power supplies for your computers. That's really teeny mini ones. They all also use for controlling megawatts of power. Um, communications and control. I mean, you can buy this Texas Instrument DSP chip for dollar fifty, and it runs at like eighty megahertz, and you can do all kinds of very nice digital control with this. It's dirt cheap. Um, you have sensing mechanism, not just smart meters in your home but various other more sophisticated devices put you on your transmission lines and figure out voltage, current, phase angle, GPS unit, and, and timestamp every 30 milliseconds. that tons of data being produced. We don't know what to do with the data. That's where we are today. Um, computing. Computing is, is separating into two parts. One is centralized cloud-based computing, network distributed computing, and the other is distributed intelligence what we now call Internet of Things. That's a very nice word. Internet of Things, in this case, these Internet of Things have to satisfy the laws of physics. Your Fitbit does not. But your Internet of Things in the grid will have to look at Kirchhoff's laws and things like that. This is not trivial. And of course, a lot of data science. As I said, there's a lot of data being produced, and we have to use the data. We don't know how to really analyze the data for this particular application, and these are all getting cheaper and better. So this is the, what I call the bits and what's, it's a Stanford and Slack innovations for the 20, 21st century grid. They said, we're not gonna throw this infrastructure that we already have, but could we overlay another infrastructure of computing and distributed connection, so the coordinator, so that when the wind goes down, can we reduce the load a little bit? But when the wind goes up, can we generate, can we store that energy somewhere? Can we use it? So this is the kind of thing that we're going to do in bits and watts. Um, this is a three big thrust integrated approach to grid, modeling, transmission, distribution as one big system. Uh, connected customers, this people have to be involved. We know how to control the thermostats remotely now. If you don't have that in your home, you will probably have that soon. And finally, a lot of data. And I won't go into the details of this. Let me move to transportation. There's a big vector that is pointing right now, and it's a very strong vector on electrification of transportation. And the reason being, this is the only reason it's not prevalent everywhere is the cost. I wish all of us could buy a Tesla. We cannot. It's expensive. And the reason it's expensive, the majority of the cost is in the battery. The battery costs have come down from about $1,000 a kilowatt hour in 2008 or so to roughly about $300 or maybe $200 something dollars per kilowatt hours in a matter of seven or eight years. This is absolutely fabulous. And the reason it has come down is all kinds of innovations in materials. You can store more energy in the same material and packaging, how you package it. So this is, and once it reaches about $150 a kilowatt hour, today it's about $300, if it reaches $150, which is likely to happen in the next 10 years or so, the cost and the range of electric vehicles will be comparable to the ones in gasoline cars. Okay. This is amazing. This is the tectonic shift in transportation. And then, give it another 10 or 15 years, you'll find deep penetration of electric vehicles. 
And people out here think big cars, Tesla cars and all, these are somehow big. The rest of the world, which is where most of the growth of transportation, they travel like this. And that can be electrified much faster because the ranges are lower, the speeds are lower, and when the speeds are lower, your range increases. Okay? So this is very, very important. The other part is that not everything can be electrified. You still need fuels. I, don't, I mean, I would love to see an electric plane, which people are trying as single passenger ones, but uh, you know, your Boeing 747 is not gonna go on a battery anytime soon. So you still need the <coughs> fuels. Liquid because that's high density. So how do we produce this? And this is the other part that I was gonna talk about. A grand challenge. We think CO2 is a problem. Could we turn CO2 into fuels? So you have you know, either water or CO2. You can split water and produce hydrogen. You can perhaps combine hydrogen with CO2 to make all these kinds of hydrocarbons or methanols or ethanols, etc. This needs a lot of energy because CO2 is what is called the lowest free energy level. For those of you who are not engineers or scientists, there's nothing free energy. There's no free energy, but we call it free energy. So how do you take from the lowest energy level of CO2, CO2 is the lowest energy level, to put it in mega hydrocarbon, this is storing energy. If that energy comes from carbon-based, coal-based sources, we're not solving anything. So how do we take these kinds of energies, and that's why it's very important that they are cheap, inexpensive, which is the world we're entering now, and get into this. And there's a lot of research that is going on at Stanford, and this is, uh, there's a whole team looking at electrochemical pathways. So you can see out here, electrochemical, photochemical, biochemical, thermochemical. This is the electrochemical team. Um, you know, Jens Norskov, Haramio, Tom Haramio, Kanan. This is chemical engineering and chemistry and material science. We're looking at trying to figure out how to reduce the cost of hydrogen production to be less than $2 a kilogram of hydrogen. $2 a kilogram of hydrogen is, is roughly $2 a gallon of gasoline equivalent. Okay, once you produce hydrogen, you can do other things. So this is one big, big challenge. We don't know how to do that. Today it's about five or six dollars a kilogram of hydrogen, which is, that means the hydrogen or the gasoline that you produce is five or six dollars a gallon of gasoline. It won't compete, at least not in the United States. So how do we get to this? And this requires science and engineering to be able to do that. The one that I, along with my colleague Will Chui, is focused on is not the electrochemical route, but the thermochemical route, because the whole chemical industry is thermochemical today. We can do that, but it requires a high temperature, 1500 degrees Celsius. We're trying to get to 800 degrees Celsius, half the temperature. And if you can do that, it, 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 it is infrastructure compatible. And we have some very nice results now, new class of materials that we've found that can do that. It is material science and engineering all together. So, again, a lot of people think that this is kind of, oh, this is too difficult, too hard. A lot of people, a lot of naysayers, by the way. And I go to Washington, in fact, I'm going there today. So it's, oh, this is going to be hard. It's all negative. Let me give you some, I would say, infamous predictions from the past, if someone says no. As long as it doesn't violate the laws of physics. <laughs> It, is, it may be possible. It may not be cost effective, but you've got to think about it. These are the infamous predictions of the past. This is Lord Kelvin in the 1890s. Radio has no future. X rays will prove to be a hoax. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. He was very opinionated, <laughs> but quite wrong. <laughs> but he was not the only one. I mean, he was so convincing that he convinced Wilbur Wright that man will not fly in two years, and that is 90 to 1. Fortunately, he had a brother. <laughs> <laughs> to convince him otherwise, in four years, they were able to fly. It didn't violate the laws of physics, there were existence proofs up there. <laughs> and the best way, and this is for you to invent the future, the best way to predict the future is invent it. And I like the quote by Arthur C. Clarke any sufficiently advanced technology cannot be distinguished from magic. And it is for you guys to do some magic now. Thank you. All right. We have two minutes for questions. I can take 
one question, and if I answer quickly, it's up to me. I can take another one. Okay. Questions? Yes. When, when you're looking at energy storage and hydrocarbons, are you also working on a top way to get the energy out, or otherwise you burn them? Isn't there carbon in the process? Okay, so the question is, uh, are you, is there a sort of a carbon balance when you're making hydrocarbons, right? The goal would be to somehow figure out how to get carbon from the atmosphere or some source would have gone out and then make liquid fuels. Okay, even if it's emitted from a source like coal-fired power plants, it would have gone out, used that carbon dioxide to make fuel and thereby displace more fossil fuel dug out of the ground. That's, that's the idea. Good question. One more. Yes. Um, do changes in our everyday lifestyle, like not buying bottled water or using like recycled bags and stuff, have an impact on like the overall carbon footprint or just changing like the energy efficiency? Great question. Do a lifestyle matter, right? In the carbon balance. Absolutely matters. One of the most important things you can do is go look at your phone and see whether it's energy efficient. How many kilowatt hours do you really use? And your home is one of the biggest users of energy. And if you can somehow reduce the energy consumption at home by design, by making it um, you know, uh, less leaky, both heat to come in or, or warmth or heat to go out, uh, you save a lot of energy. In this area, we don't need air conditioners. And I've been fighting with my wife. My wife wants air conditioning. You know, and I say, you don't need one. You can bear 80 degrees for a few days. I think we can do that. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that you've got to be able to do uh, to reduce your energy consumption. If you're traveling, nothing like public transportation to reduce your energy footprint. Um, and that's the kind of thing lifestyle really matters. We want to make Stanford one of the models of excellence in terms of the carbon emissions. This is a living laboratory. And so we want to, that's one of the goals that Sally Benson, my co-director and I have, is to see how to make Stanford campus and Slack sort of zero carbon emissions. Okay, net. But you've got to do it very cost effectively. So we call it double net zero. Net zero emissions at net zero cost. If you can do it cost effectively, it becomes a role model for everyone else. Because cost really matters. We are privileged out here in, in terms of, you know, we have some wealth to be able to do it and we, we may not mind a little bit of extra cost to be able to save the planet. But we can't ask the rest of the world to do the same. So if, if being sustainable, reducing emissions, reducing energy consumption becomes a cheaper way of doing living. That is the right way to do it. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>